We're continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 9. You remember Jesus has taken his disciples north to Caesarea Philippi up near Mount Hermon. And uh, Peter there has made a great confession that he is the Christ. The full confession is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter has made that confession, which wasn't from Peter at all, though. It was from the Lord. It was from the Father, as Jesus told him. And then Peter made the terrible counsel to avoid the cross in which Jesus had to correct him. And so now we read at the beginning of chapter 9, And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Had an experience once that was one of those that you'd call glorious. That's what I thought it was years ago on a bright spring day. My wife and I sat on a hill in the Judean desert. It was covered in wildflowers, yellow, white, blue, and red. Green grass carpeted the mountains. The desert had bloomed, and it was enchanting. I thought, I don't want to leave. I want to stay. Well, Peter felt the same way on a mountaintop when he saw the kingdom of God. Alas, I couldn't stay, and neither could Peter. He tried, but had to travel on to Jerusalem. That's where Jesus' destiny lay, so that Peter could someday inherit the kingdom to come. That's the subject of Mark chapter 9. Jesus had taken his disciples north to Caesarea Philippi at the foot of Mount Hermon, which with its uh, snow-covered summit. There Peter confessed that Jesus is the Christ. That was a great confession of faith. Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, is the King of Israel. The Pharisees would have scoffed, but Jesus accepted that answer. In fact, he told Peter that his Father in heaven had revealed it to him. But then he told all of the disciples that he would die, and they must follow him by taking up their cross. Their life would be one of cross-bearing, not ruling. So what about the kingdom, they wondered, and the power and the glory? 
So chapter 9 begins with a statement to encourage them and strengthen their faith, but also one that has puzzled Bible students and encouraged skeptics. Truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Disciples will see the kingdom. Bertrand Russell, the influential British mathematician and philosopher of the last generation, cited this as one reason that he was not a Christian. Jesus was wrong about his second coming. Jesus thought his kingdom would appear during the lifetime of his disciples, and it clearly didn't. It was a false prophecy. Now, on the face of it, that may seem to have some weight, but really it says more about Russell than Jesus and shows he didn't read the passage or the Bible carefully or seriously. Obviously, the disciples didn't think Jesus was mistaken. This affected them directly. If they thought his words had failed, they would have become disillusioned and disbanded. But they didn't do that. Instead, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the incident. Peter refers to it twice, once in 1 Peter and then in 2 Peter. All affirmed the truth and the importance of Jesus' statement. So when did some of the disciples see the kingdom of God? The answer is six days later when three of them witnessed Jesus gloriously transfigured before them. It was as though a curtain was lifted and the deity veiled in flesh was revealed. Donald Gray Barnhouse explained it as God saying to them, though the road just ahead will be hard, this is the way things are going to be at the second coming. In other words, the road of cross-bearing will be difficult, but this is the end of it. This is the goal of it, the kingdom of God in all of its glory and power. But... This is also God's support of his son and his mission. Six, day, six days after Jesus told his disciples he would be killed and then rejected Satan's temptation to avoid the cross, God now honors his son. The Lord took three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they went up on a high mountain, maybe Mount Hermon, which is 9,000 feet high and near by where they were. The Lord chose this place for revelation, not only because of the solitude that it afforded them, but because of the majesty of it. Mountains were places where God often revealed himself. You can think of a couple of examples yourself. There's Mount Sinai. Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. And not only that, but it was there on that mountain that God revealed to Moses his glory. Centuries later, it was on Mount Horeb that uh, Elijah was given a revelation by the Lord God in a gentle breeze. According to Luke, the disciples were asleep when it happened, indicating that it was night when all of this occurred. And suddenly, the, the mountain was aglow with light. Mark says Jesus was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Luke describes them as gleaming and that word gleaming has the idea of flashing like lightning while Matthew adds that the Lord's face shone like the sun when you begin to read all of these different descriptions you, you get the, the sense that the gospel writers lack the words to adequately describe what occurred it was unearthly and revealed both the Lord's glory and his purity whiter than white but in addition to that, while this 
dazzling event was happening, Jesus was joined by two others, Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus, which shows the vast reach of Christ's authority. Kings could summon great men to their events, just as today presidents can invite celebrities and important people to attend affairs of state. But who can call the great from among the dead? Imagine President Trump, if he had invited George Washington and Abraham Lincoln to his inauguration and they had come. What would we think? But Jesus did that. But it was more than a display of authority and power. Both of these men were, were towering figures in Jewish thought and occupied important places in the Old Testament. Moses was the lawgiver. And Elijah was the first of the great prophets. So they represented more than themselves. Together, they represented the two major divisions of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. Their appearance was to indicate that the law and the prophets testify to Christ. He's the fulfillment of them. So for that reason, for what they represented, their presence was appropriate. But also, both men had unusual departures from this world. Elijah didn't die. Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Moses did die, but he was buried mysteriously in Moab in an unmarked grave by the Lord. <clears throat> they were talking to Jesus, Mark says. He doesn't reveal what was said, but Luke does. They were speaking about his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, which he would soon accomplish at Jerusalem. So these men, who had unusual departures from this world, came to speak to Jesus about his departure and confirm what Jesus had told his disciples six days earlier, that he must suffer many things and be killed. Peter didn't want to hear that, and he tried to turn Jesus away from the cross, but there on that mountain he heard two heavenly witnesses affirm that it must occur and that it was about to occur. It would occur soon. In fact, the importance of his departure is indicated from the conversation. Of all the things that they could have talked about, his birth, his miracles, his great teaching, some of the high points of the revelation he had given. This is what they came to him to talk about, to encourage him. And they did so because this was the very reason he had come into this world. In fact, this is the great subject of heaven itself. Revelation 5 is a vision of heaven. And in it, in that vision of heaven, in the center of that vision, in the center of heaven, is a lamb standing before God's throne. It is standing as if slain, a resurrected lamb. And they sang praise to him. Worthy are you, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe, or literally out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Then they say, you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. That's why Christ came. That's why he came to die to purchase his people and make them a kingdom. Without the cross, there's no kingdom. There's no salvation, there's no Christianity, no heaven, at least no heaven for us, no resurrection, no good news. And so that was the subject of the conversation of the three. It was an important conversation. 
But then Peter interrupted it. Rabbi, he said, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. How he knew one was Moses and the other Elijah isn't explained. What is explained is why he responded as he did. Mark says in verse 6, he did not know what to answer. When we don't know what to say, it's best to say nothing. But Peter answered, and so he is a lesson in Proverbs 18, verse 13. Maybe Mike will preach on Peter when he comes to that passage in Proverbs. It says, he who gives an answer before he hears is folly and shame to him. It is folly and shame to him. In other words, a wise man keeps silent and listens and does not speak. That's how we learn, by listening. Peter didn't do that. He spoke impulsively, and he put his foot in his mouth. But then who hasn't done that? This was a unique supernatural event but it has the authenticity of real life we all do what Peter did and for the same reason we don't listen and don't learn but Peter was more impressed with the sights he saw than the speech that he heard and wanted to hold on to the moment it was blissful he didn't want to come down from the mountain to the toil of the world below. In a way, it's understandable. Just as Jesus has promised six days earlier, Peter and James and John saw the kingdom of God. They saw the glory of it in the glory of the king. And he wanted to hold on to it. But again... Before the crown, there had to be a cross. And while Peter didn't realize it, his suggestion that they stay on the mountain and not go on to Jerusalem was really counseling Christ again to skip the cross. This time it was not Jesus who corrected Peter, but his father. When a cloud suddenly formed on the mountaintop, like the cloud that covered Mount Sinai. Then God spoke out of it and said, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. In other words, don't talk. Listen to him and learn from him and obey him. That is counsel for all of us. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. He didn't say, listen to them. He didn't mention Moses or Elijah. The reason is, Jesus is not just one more of them, not just one more of the prophets. He is the Christ. He is the King. And He is unique. Bishop Ryle wrote, They were but stars. He was the sun. They were but witnesses. He was the truth. And as witnesses, they fade away. He stands. This statement by the Father gives the final answer to the question Jesus had asked earlier. Who do you say that I am? The world has a variety of answers as the disciples showed to the Lord. And as we ourselves know, as we hear what the word the world has to say about him but this is the definitive answer this is God's answer to that question he is God's son he is the very person David prophesied in Psalm 2 where God calls the king calls the Messiah my son and gave the world to him as his inheritance but that same son also said that he must suffer many things and be killed. And the prophets agreed. They testified to that. It would happen in Jerusalem. That 
especially was what Peter and the other disciples needed to listen to. He must be killed. He must become a sacrifice. That's what the world needs to listen to. Paul later wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that no one will inherit the kingdom of God who has not been washed, sanctified, and justified. Only Christ's sacrifice and faith in it can do that. That's what the transfiguration proved. Jesus is the Christ. He is the king and he is more He's more than a man, more than a prophet. He is the Son of God become man. He is the God-man. The kingdom of God will come in glory, but not before the pain and the shame of the cross. Jesus taught that. Listen to him. Then it ended. The cloud lifted and Mark wrote in verse 8, All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. The glory that had been revealed was again veiled and together they went down to the plain below, back to the world where the Lord's path led to Jerusalem and the cross. But as they went down the mountain with the minds of the three disciples filled with wonder and awe from what they had witnessed, Jesus told them not to speak about it to others. Now he knew they still didn't know enough to explain correctly what they had seen and didn't want reports of the event to fuel misguided fervor in the, the crowds. So he told them to be quiet told them to wait to speak about these things until the Son of Man rose from the dead. <clears throat> and then they would understand. Then everything would fall into place. But at this point, Christ's death still puzzled them. Well, because his death puzzled them, his resurrection only added to their confusion. And a discussion of it led to a second conversation about the problems of prophecy. One had to do with Elijah and what part he would play in the end times and the, the coming of the kingdom. So in verse 11 they asked Jesus why it is the scribes say that Elijah must come first. It's probably a reference to Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 which is a prophecy of Elijah coming before the day of the Lord and restoring the hearts of the people. The disciples thought of Elijah as only the Tishbite, the one that they had just witnessed there on the mountain. But John the Baptist was also a kind of Elijah. You go back to the descriptions of him in the Gospels and he dressed very similarly to Elijah the prophet. The clothes that he wore, the food that he ate. He was an ascetic kind of guy and he was very much like the, the great prophet. And so Jesus expands the prophecy to apply to John. Verses 12 and 13 we read, And he said to them, Elijah does first come and restore all things. In other words, Malachi is right. That's the simple revelation of the last prophecy we have in our Bible in the Old Testament. And yet, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. In other words, if Israel's leaders had been receptive to John's ministry as forerunner to the Messiah, they could have, he could have fairly been described as a second Elijah. But because of the leader's hardness of heart and the action of Herod, that didn't happen. They did to him whatever they wished, Jesus said. And so the Son of Man would suffer many things. So the Lord 
brought the conversation back from the, the far future and his second coming to the near future and his death. That was what they needed to understand. That was the essential thing. These other things are interesting. These other issues and questions are valid, but what is of first importance is, of the th of, is that of which the three spoke on the mountain and that which he brings them back to here, that he would suffer many things. That's why they were coming down from the mountain. Christ had to suffer the cross, and they had to pick up their cross and follow him. That is the life of a child of God. It isn't on glorious mountaintops or a flowery hill under blue skies, but in the valley where life is routine and where work is usually mundane and often hard. It's where we live and it's where we're tested. That's what this incident of the transfiguration was designed for. It was designed to prepare them for, for the valley, to prepare Jesus for his cross, encourage him and the disciples for taking up their cross and encouraging them. It gives us three lessons. One about the future, one about the past, and one about the present. First, the future. The disciples had been given a great revelation, one that confirmed Peter's confession that Jesus is the Son of God, and one that authenticated all that the Lord had taught. And in seeing God's Son, they saw God's kingdom. The king and the kingdom cannot be separated. His glory and power is the glory and power of the kingdom. So this event, the unveiling of Christ, confirmed the prophetic word in the Old Testament about the coming kingdom on the earth. Peter wrote of the transfiguration, and he wrote of it in that way in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. It proved that they, the, the disciples, the apostles, had not followed clever fables. They hadn't been fooled into believing things that are fanciful. So he said, we have the prophetic word made more sure. And then he adds, you do well to pay attention. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Pay attention to what the prophet said. Really, he's saying what the Lord God, the Father, said to him. Listen to him. Men may scoff at the idea of Christ's return and his second coming. Scoff at the kingdom to come. But Peter and others saw the visible, the, the visible proof of its power and glory. It was an encouragement to them it would reaffirm to them that they could suffer nothing in this all too brief life that can compare with what they will receive in return at his coming and in the coming world without end. Christ will someday return in great power and reign upon the earth and we will reign with him. Nothing that we sacrifice in this life can compare to that. Nothing that we lose in this life will compare to what God will make up for in that world to come. And history is moving toward that glorious goal. Th that is the promise and it is our hope. And it's a certain hope. So as Peter says, we should know these great promises of the Old Testament and believe them. Pay attention. They are reliable. They are true. They are God's revelation. That's the future. But it is based on an event in the past, a necessary event, the central event of history, the cross and the subject Moses, Elijah, and Jesus spoke of, his departure told the disciples that he must suffer many things and be killed. That was his mission. It was 
what he came to do and he was faithful to it. Faithful to it for those disciples, faithful to it for you, for your salvation. That is love. That's the greatest expression of love. You see that, I think, so well from the contrast between the crucifixion and the transfiguration. In the one, he was honored as the Son of God. In the other, he was despised as a common criminal. On the mountain, he stood with two saints clothed in white and light. On the cross, he hung with two sinners naked and bloody. They talked about that, he and Moses and Elijah. That was his mission, and he was faithful to it. That is why he came, and the reason he, he veiled his glory in a physical body and a true, genuine human nature, it's the reason he became a real, genuine human being a man so that he could die in our place and by his death give us life. That being so, he should be the greatest object of our interest. That's the implication of the last statement Mark makes that the disciples saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. Those two words, Jesus alone, make that point. The saints and prophets are illustrious figures, but as nothing compared to him. They only point to him. It is Jesus alone who saves. He is unique. He is God and man, God's son, the Redeemer King. And so we are to listen to him. That's the third lesson. That's the instruction God gave his disciples. He gives it to us. Listen to him. That's how we live today. That's the lesson for the present. Reading his word. Studying the scriptures. That's where he speaks to us. That's where God reveals things to us. We have great responsibilities in this life. We have great responsibilities as saints, as believers in Jesus Christ. We, we need to serve others and use our gifts. We need to, to witness to others. All of these activities are very important. They are necessary activities. But they are not of the first importance. The first thing we should do is listen to Christ. That's where Peter failed. He proposed taking action, making three tabernacles. What he should have done was be quiet and listen to what Christ had to say. That's a message for us today when people are guided so much by their emotions, by feelings, Feelings are good. Emotions are natural and proper and sometimes especially so when we're singing a great hymn. But feelings and emotions don't guide us. People today want that. The Christians today want that. They want mountaintop experiences. They want moments of glory. Who doesn't? But we're not to look for that. We are to listen to Christ. And that can be a bit mundane. That can be... A, a, a sometimes plodding experience, studying his word, working at it, getting his knowledge and wisdom. That's the only way we gain God's wisdom, which is true wisdom. It's through the study of his word, which fits us, equips us for life in the dark valleys. Does that by changing us. In verse 2, Mark describes Jesus as being transfigured. It was the same word that Paul used in uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18, metamorpho, which is the word from which we get metamorphosis. That's a word that we all learned early in high school science. 
metamorphosis. It describes the, the transformation, for example, that takes place when a, a caterpillar is changed into a butterfly. Metamorphosis, a dramatic, dramatic change. Who can compare the worm with the butterfly? And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul is saying that that kind of transformation is taking place in us as we study the Word of God. As we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, he says, we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. A metamorphosis from a worm to a monarch. An interchange occurs when, when we see the Lord's glory, the revelation of it. I can't explain to you how that happens, but this is what the Word of God teaches, that as we study it, as we reflect upon it, it actually has an effect upon our inner life, our inner being, and we are changed. And so as we study the Bible, as we listen and learn from Him, we are affected. We are affected for the good. We become like Christ. How nice it would be to live in a beautiful, carefree place. But that's not God's will for us today. And that's not, not where we are changed. It is in the mundane and the difficult valley of this world. As we listen to our Lord through His Word and obey Him and serve Him. That is when and how we are changed. It is through faith in His Word and obedience to it. Transformed from glory to glory, we become knowledgeable and wise, mature, and able to deal with life's difficulties the right way and help others to do that very same thing. That's what the Word of God makes us, wise and helpful people. That's where we, God's people, live in the present. But the present, as difficult as it may be, as mundane as it may be, the present is always giving way to the future. In fact, we're in the future compared to where we were a second ago when I first said that. The future is always coming. The present is always giving way to it, and the future holds glory and reward for us. It's coming. We are constantly moving toward that great and glorious day. We are moving toward it at this very moment. We think of ourselves as standing still, I think, in time. And yet the reality is we are on a fast train down the track to the, to the destination. And we will arrive there. And this event was for Peter and the disciples and for us to give the encouragement that though the road ahead will be hard, that it involves carrying our cross, the Lord's return is certain and the glory on that mountain will someday fill this world. That's what we're to live for. That's what lasts. We're to listen to God's Son. We are to live for Him. But we can only do that by first believing in Him. Have you done that? John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Here God says, His only begotten Son is His beloved Son. That's who He gave. That's the measure of God's love for us. And it is the assurance that he receives all who believe in him. If you've not believed, look to him. Trust in him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you who have, rejoice. A glorious day is coming. May we, in the meantime, in this valley in which we live, live obediently to him, for him, and to his glory. May God help us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for a glorious text that we have, a transfiguration, 
which reveals so much about your son, who he is, the eternal son of God become man, confirms the greatness and the importance of his mission of dying for us, and yet shows us what the consequence of that is. The kingdom to come. He purchased us to be a kingdom and priests and we will reign with him upon the earth. We thank you for that, Father. It's not anything in us that merited such blessing. It is all of you. It's your grace. We thank you for that. Thank you for your Son who laid down his life for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.